Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to all of you. My name is Mama Insan Alim Bermasalian and today I'll be presenting to you the knockout panels for passageway at the concourse level of Kampung Baru North Station, Kuala Lumpur. Before we begin, I would like to brief to you the things that we're going to be discussing, which is the first one is the introduction, the second one is methodology, the third one is difficulties and challenges, and the last one is conclusion. So the first one is introduction of concourse and our panel. So concourse we define as an open area where roads and routes intercept and people meet. Concourse is located above the platform level and also the construction method for the Kampung Baru North Station site is by using a top-down method which is as you can see in this diagram. The construction was started from the street level and then to the concourse level and the last one is platform level. So the second one is not a panel. Not a panel is a part of the frame wall that will knock out by the excavator or breaker and it will act an, as an opening for the entrance and the passageway. As you can see in the diagram where a circle red, this area is supposed to be a different wall and when the different wall is being knocked out, it is called as an opening or entrance. So we move on to the method construction of not a panel. The first step is surveying work. The surveyor will mark the joint and also the location of the panels which you can see in the diagram they were marking the panels for p105 after the surveyor has marked the panels inspection by the qc engineer will be done to make sure that the marking area of the kop was accurate according to the drawing itself so after the inspection cutting off panels will be commenced cutting off panel will categorize into two which is the first one is scoring work to drill a hole throughout the knockout panels and the second one is by placing a diamond wire saw through the hole that we have done during the coring work and we will cut both vertical and one bottom horizontal part of the knot opener. As you can see in the diagram, this is the result of the cut section of the knot opener. The top one was not supposed to be cut to avoid the panels from falling. The fourth one is hacking of panels. After the cutting of panels, hacking of panels by the breaker or excavator will be done and the last one is remedial and housekeeping work will be commenced by clearing the excess rebar and clearing out the debris of the area. We now be discussing about the difficulties and challenge faced during the knock out panels work. The first one is cable management. As per Gamuda requirement, cable must be arranged above the head level. If we fail to do so, it will interfere the clearing debris work by the bulkhead and the bulkhead will be stuck to the cable. The second one is flow of clearing debris work. The absence of crane to lift the dumpster bin will prevent the workflow for the bulkhead to clear the debris off the concourse level. The second one is this absence of debris lorry to clear the dumpster area at the roof level will prevent debris to be lifted out to the dumpster area. The third one is sound disturbance. As you all know, hacking of knockout panels produce a really loud noise. So when the hacking noise was out of control, the resident of City Sky resident will lodge a complaint about the noise. The fourth one is water supply. The absence of water supply for the knockout panel will lead to uncontrolled dust on the site. If there was a water supply, the water pipe that was attached on the excavator may tangle, thus preventing the flow of the water. The fifth one, which is over hacking of knockout panels. So, overhacking of knockout panels occur due to the negligence of the worker and also the supervisor since they does not supervise the work correctly. Overhacking will damage the remaining diaphragm wall and also will decrease the load capacity of remaining diaphragm wall. Other than that, when we will overhack the knockout panels, we need to we need to rectify it. So we are moving on to the last part which is the conclusion. For the conclusion of metallurgy, knockout panel is a difficult construction and need specialized and experienced workers to execute the work of knockout panels. Other than that, frequent inspection by the QC engineer, by the TWC are needed to make sure that the quality of work are maintained and to make sure the defects can be minimized. Other than that, all steps of knockout panels construction must be followed and executed correctly to avoid any problem from arise. The second one is conclusion for the difficulties and challenges. The first point is noise is a major problem for hacking knockout panels. Other than that, water supply must be sufficient to avoid dust to spread and also to avoid health issues such as asthma and so on. Moreover, overhacking of knockout panels may damage the structure wall and as I said before, overhacking will lead to rectification and rectification work will result in additional costs and contractor will encounter loss of profit due to the rectification work. The last one is management of cable need to be checked by the safety officer to avoid harm and injury from happening on the site. So that's all from me. Thank you and Assalamualaikum.
Assalamualaikum and a good day. I am Ahmad Faiz Zofri bin Muhammad Noor from School of Housing, Building and Planning, University of Science Malaysia. Today, I will present my research paper which is Mechanical and Durability Properties of Banana Fiber Reinforced Foam Concrete. I am start with the introduction of my research. As we know that the construction industry in Malaysia has expanded drastically in the past few years and it contributed to the first income for GDP. But uh, adopting a green environment in the construction industry has been a severe issue in Malaysia. Uh, this is because of the most construction materials produced from the non-sustainable products which is need a high amount of energy and it is a lack contribution to the green environment. So that this research paper introduce the use of natural fibers in the foam concrete uh, to achieve the green environment uh, in the construction industry. This research paper also uh, help for better understanding on the usage of natural fibers as one of the materials that will be used in the construction. Now I am presenting on problem statement of my research. First, uh, there are many usage of the synthetic fibers in the foam concrete, but uh, in the wet condition, it has a weakness where it tends to absorb water and lose its insulating values. Second is the properties of lightweight foam concrete itself, uh, which is it is easily cracked, low intestinal strength, and have shrinkage problem in low density. And the third one is the higher percentage of banana fiber in the foam concrete will be cause desegregation and also roughness. Here is my aim and objective for this research. I start with the aim of this study which is to identify the potential of banana fibers to strengthening the foam concrete for mechanical and durability enhancements. To achieve the aim, uh, there are two objectives in my study. The first one is to determine the mechanical properties of the foam concrete uh, with the inclusion of banana fiber and the second one is to establish uh, the durability properties of foam concrete uh, with the addition of banana fiber. Moving forward to the methodology of this research, uh, I begin with the identifying the problem statement, objective of research and significance of the study. Next, I move to the stage where the development and formulation of the mixed proportion for this research. I also prepare the sample in the concrete laboratory with different percentage of banana fibers. Start with 0.15%, 0.3%, 0.45% and 0.6% uh, by mix. Then the concrete specimen will be let dry for few days for curing and evaluation of each performance. The experimental works and test program will be conducted on this specific day. It based on the mechanical properties which consist of uh, compressive, pleasure and tensile strength and also it based on the durability properties such as water absorption, ultra ultrasonic possibility, porosity and also dry shrinkage. After that, the data analysis and come up with the findings and start with discussion and also the conclusion. Here is the experimental test on mechanical properties. There are three tests that were conducted. The first one is axial compression test with the cute specimen. The standard that I use is the British standards uh, 12390 part 3. Next is the plagiarial test with the prison specimen and it's, it is according to the ASTM C348. And the lastly is the splitting test stress with the cylinder specimen uh, according to the STM C496 stroke C496M. I also conducted uh, four types of tests on the durability properties. The first one is the water absorption test with the cylinder specimen. Second is the water absorption test also with cylinder specimen. The third one is dry shrinkage test with the prison specimen and lastly is ultrasonic pass velocity test uh, in the prism specimen. For the conclusion from my research, uh, from the test conducted on the durability properties uh, shows that the foam concrete with the addition of fiber 
has improvement as the percentage of banana fiber added into the foam concrete increased. This is uh, due to the morphology of banana fiber, uh, which is enhance the properties of foam concrete and act as the filler that give the compact composition of the microstructure, uh, which is in this way it lessens the size and measures of the pores. Uh, in terms of the mechanical properties of foam concrete, uh, with addition of banana fiber, it is identified that the addition of 0.45% of banana fiber by mix in the foam concrete give the outstanding uh, mechanical properties uh, compared to the other percentage. Uh, this is due to the banana fiber uh, reinforce the bonding between the fiber and cement matrix. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. Assalamualaikum and greetings. My name is Shahira Sajuradwan. I'm from Department of Pre Environment Studies and Technology, UITM Pera, Malaysia. I'm going to present an extended abstract entitled Current Devices of Real Time Construction Site Progress Tracking. For the introduction, progress tracking of the construction project is one of the critical activities that need to follow the schedule that has been set at the early phase of the construction planning where the devices with applications are used to track the construction progress tracking. There are three issues for this study, which is the first is ineffective paper-based documentation. Second, the data obtained from the site are not digitally stored. And the third is accurate data is unable to be obtained. For the objective for the study, which is the first is to identify the current devices used for the construction progress tracking at the construction site, and the second is to identify the software the functioning for the devices for the real-time construction tracking. For the literature review, first, the current manual tracking methods are time-consuming and error-prone according to the Tukan et al. 2012. Second, augmented reality or AR makes use of the existing environment at the same time implementing the virtual elements to appear as if both are together at the same time, according to the Dan Levy and DD 2014, as cited in Ahmed 2019. Third, the data obtained from the construction site will be stored as a database, then linked from the construction site to the project schedule. Then the schedule will be automatically updated and ready to be assessed by the end users, according to the Ghanem 2007. Next, for the methodology, for this study, literature review was conducted from different sources, including thesis, general papers, and conference papers. For the next section of methodology, the first is the applications of Oracle Primavera, Autodesk Revit, and Autodesk Navis work will be integrated into one application that is MIT App Inventor, added with a meta creator to create AR or augmented reality scenario and Junayo, they will be installed into the tracking device. Next, the device are ready to be used on the construction site for the purpose of progress tracking. Next, using the Google Fusion table, the data obtained from the construction site are able to be stored digitally and the offsite tracker are able to update the data over the internet before it is finally are accessible for the end users. Moving on to the analysis and findings of the extended abstract. The architects and engineers in Slovenia preferred to use augmented reality on tablet PC as the best option compared to either option as shown in the figure one. This is because the success of the Slovenia in the construction of railway line that is 17.4 kilometers that is using full life cycles of AR back in 2015. Another analysis and findings for this study. Nigeria is one of the developing countries that previously the construction personnel only had access to the basic applications. Therefore, there is comparison made between the usage of Microsoft Project and Primavera shows that 
Microsoft Project is one of the widely used tracking software compared to Primavera as shown in Table 1. In conclusion, the application of tracking devices that can capture real-time data should be used to substitute the current practice of tracking. The PC that has been preferred compared to other devices due to its ability to adapt with current software and its user-friendly characteristics. This study contributed the idea of the real-time tracking process that helps to facilitate related parties and to promote the adaptation of the technology, as well as the construction personnel would prefer Microsoft Project and Primavera as the software that could be used for the construction site progress tracking. Finally, reaching to the end, the evolution of the built environment works better with the technology. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We are from Landscape Architecture Department of Faculty of Architecture, Planning and Surveying, UITM Puncak Alam Branch, Selangor. My name is Farah Wahida binti Mahazir and my partner Nabila Huda binti Pauzan are going to present our project GIS as a successful landscape planning tool for the determination of flood prone area in Kelanang, Selangor. Kelanang land cover was most populated by various types of plantation, especially palm oil. Most of the water run off through this area by small and natural drainage system toward the sea. The existing water management was not sustainable and systematic to handle during heavy rainfall. From this map, it shown that the inventory data collected including contour, river, drainage and flood hotspot of the Klanang. Klanang is a desert area of Kuala Langat Selangor being listed of one of the potential or most affected during monsoon season. Going in detail, Kampung Klanang was the most mentioned by the Jabatan Pengairan dan Saliran JPS. Kampung Klanang was located near Langat River and Pantai Klanang. Flooding season usually happen in between October to December. As we can see from the chart, flood occurrence and mean rainfall. It shown that the higher mean rainfall, the higher flood occurrence. Another chart shown that flood occurrence among the district. By viewing this chart, you can see which district are the most affected during monsoon season. The aim for this project is to visualize existing topography which determine the natural water management by producing few GIS analysis in 2D and 3D mapping of Kelanang, Kuala Langat, Selangor. Next, we move to the objective of this project. The main objective is to identify which area have the highest possibility of curve flood during a year. The second is to allocate the area of lacking facilities of drainage in Kelanang area. The third is to mapping the flow of water runoff through all areas. Lastly, to identify which area would affect it to be involved in widening drainage system project in the future. Now we move to the methodology for this project. Started with the process we delineated area-wide watershed. The first step, we add DEM and River Network Klanang to new data frame. By using these two data, we can create flow direction, sink, fill, flow accumulation, corn and stream link until we can produce watershed as an output. Moving forward is flow direction analysis. We use River Network Klanang and DEM in the beginning to perform resample, aspect, reclassify, convert raster to point, add all value and change the point to specific area as mentioned in aspect. Final product, we can see that the flow direction in each cell on the DEM dataset. The last analysis that we did is buffer analysis. We use soil, land use and river Klanang shape file for the input. We are using multiple buffer dialog to enter 200, 500 and 40,000 meter distant as referred from the guideline for hydrology area. After that, we click to see the area of Klanak only and then we add all value and then it shows the result. The study average mean annual rainfall range from 1,623 mm to 2,960. The mean annual potential evaporation transpiration range between 1,431 and 1,610. The average temperature is 27 degrees Celsius throughout the year. The relative humidity varies between 62 and 96 percent with an average of roughly 82 percent. EEM, slope, gradient, water precipitation, water flow, and groundwater density are some of the data obtained for the study area. Unlined and blind drains are the drainage types found in the study area. The drainage patterns on the other hand are rectangular. A drainage patterns in which the main stream and their tributaries display many right angles, bands, and exhibit sections of red rocks. The local authorities created Rancangan Tempatan Kuala Langan in the hopes of reducing the risk that could be harmful to the locals. 
the drainage system is the primary focus for solving flooding issues. This is in the collaborations of GIS data and on-site observation. From the analysis, the main objective of this study is to identify the water potential area that is affected during the monsoon season. By completing this task, the Design Development Initiative can be proposed or suggested to attract people to experience the area. The watershed analysis is used for the management and planning of natural resources and give hydrological modeling with the relevant inputs. Watershed analysis does not only provide catchment boundaries but also provide hydrological parameters that can be used in management programs to avoid direction analysis. By using the EM and counter data, the flow direction of water can be seen after completing flow direction analysis. In buffer analysis, we can identify the potential of the area nearby Langat River that can reserve as a floodplain. Buffer analysis help to determine potential floodplain to avoid any lower structure proposed in the area. As a conclusion, after performing the analysis, we can identify which areas are suitable to avoid flooding area. This analysis helps to imagine the natural existing on-site to propose new development. Unfortunately, Identifying every that affected requires monsoon data. The current analysis does not involve this data and the monsoon data can help identify areas that are most affected while PowerPoint data can help to identify inlets and outlets. This involves data that needs on-site or detailed secondary data. During the analysis, the data involved are not the latest version and this becomes trend as it is hard to relate with the real side. Here is the final result of 3D flood simulation in Axin. That's all from us. Thank you. Greetings panels, my name is Nancy Tumi Ana Ikilawa and I'll be presenting my research title Industrial Revolution 4.0 Transformation Challenges and Opportunity in Malaysia Construction Industry So let us begin by watching the following video to understand the concept of IR 4.0 The fourth industrial revolution It's a fusion of the physical, the digital and the biological world It's changing not only what we are doing It's changing who we are as you can see from the video, the IR 4.0 was introduced by Klaus Web in 2016. It is really the notion of the digital technology pervasively impacting every walks of life in the world industry in every parts of the globe. Due to the circumstance, a proper strategy needed to be established. Hence, this paper intended to bridge the gaps between the challenges and opportunity of IR 4.0 in Sarawak. The research aim is to identify the challenges and opportunity of IR 4.0 transformation toward Malaysian construction industry. The three research problems that are pointed out by Maskuri, Lesniak, and Arifin are lack of productivity, high cost of technical equipment, and also the fear of jobless. There are three research objectives. The first one is to study on the industrial revolution of 4.0 in Malaysia construction industry. Meanwhile, the second and the third objective is to identify the challenges and opportunities in implementing the IR 4.0 in the construction industry. As for the research scope, the main focus are the opportunities and the challenges of IR 4.0. Besides, the respondent are the construction key players in Sarawak comprised of engineers, QS, etc. Meanwhile, the location are from Kuching, Serian, Cebu, Bintulu and Miri. The data collection method that is applied in this research is quantitative method. This is because of the emergence of the pandemic. So a set of 120 questionnaires will be distributed via Google Form to all the construction key players in Sarawak. In addition, SignDirect and Google Scholar are the two main outlets of reviewing the literature to ensure that the data are reliable. Meanwhile, the data analysis method is SPSS, due to its performance. Besides, the average index method is used due to its nature of time saving and less complexity in terms of formula. Next is analysis and finding. So section A shows the region that participated in the questionnaires. The highest is Kuching with 39%, which is equivalent to 32 people. This is due to the fact that most of the large to medium companies are located in Kuching as compared to the other areas. Besides, Section B shows the highest respondent, which are the engineers. This is due to the snowball sampling that allows the networking of direct-indirect relationship to form with the respondent. 
Meanwhile, Section C shows the commonly used technology, which is BIM, due to its recognition and application in the construction industry. Moving forward, based on Section D, which is Challenges Factors, the respondent agreed that suitability of standard process, skill, and equipment with project is the greatest challenge. This is due to the fact that if the equipment and the nature of project are unsuitable, it will lead to a loss in terms of return of investment. Besides, high equipment cost is undeniable the common factor accounted for years. In addition, organization reluctant to change is another factor. This is due to the fact that the organization they are used to the common practice and working on a new framework is quite time consuming. Meanwhile, Section E shows the opportunity factors where the respondent agreed that the local company they can maximize the performance through technology. This is because technology is related with efficiency and increase of productivity. In addition, technology such as drone can help to enhance the construction safety. Lastly, it is cost efficient in the long run because technology like BIM helps to minimize waste in advance as early as the planning stage. To conclude, a proper strategy needed to be implemented in order to bridge the gaps of challenges and opportunity of IR 4.0. Besides, the three objectives had been successfully achieved. So based on the finding, the suitability of technology, the high cost and human mindset needed to change in order to successfully utilize the technologies. Assalamualaikum and good day everyone. I am Ishi Shafika Benji Sanusi from UITM Seri Iskandar Perak. We will be presenting to you about my research topic which is evaluation of road condition in Mersing District. Roads are one of transportation infrastructure that are classified as public goods. It means that everyone has the same access to road and should get the minimum level of ease of access. Road performance refers to a road's ability to operate, depends mainly upon conditions of pavement surfaces. The assessment made by most road departments and highway authorities of the pavement surface condition is utilized as an indicator of the pavement's ability to continue providing the necessary service, which is to serve traffic. In addition, the pavement condition assessment is also being utilized in identifying road surface defects, insufficiencies of the pavement, corrective actions needed to be done, the budgetary demands, and pavement maintenance rehabilitation planning and programming. This study is to research the three main problems. The first problem is road maintenance limited funding. The low appreciation for management joined with an increasing maintenance cost has made the maintenance task to become increasingly difficult. The lack of awareness regarding the state of road condition prevent road maintenance agencies from adequately identifying the fund necessary for correct maintenance on time. The second problem is traffic overloading. Pavement damage derives from the deformation made by a large commercial vehicle. The increasing vehicle load causes cracks and depressions on the pavement surface. The third drawback associated with the road condition is the weather and the intrusion of water content into the pavement surface. Rainfall impacts the pavement layer's stability and strength since this alters the soil's moisture content. This research aims to describe the road condition in Mersing District. The following objectives have been made to fulfill the aim of the study. Number one is to determine the road defects in Mersing District. Number two is to identify the conditions of the road defects in Mersing District. Scope of research. Firstly, the study was conducted in only one district in Johor, which is Mersing, and the samples were from five selected roads in Mersing Districts. Therefore, the results cannot be generalized for all the roads in Johor, specifically and Malaysia. Secondly, this study used pavement condition index and visual observation. The study did not utilize any advanced technology, and the structure and geography of the subgrade of the soil were not examined in this research. Thirdly, there are limitations in terms of study time frame. The roads were observed in December 2020, thus some changes might have occurred in the future. 
Research Methodology. The primary data for this study is visual observation. Visual observation was done on each sample unit of the five roads. The evaluation was conducted by taking photographs of each of the defects that were found on the road. The assessment was conducted with an assistant engineer to supervise and confirm the type of defects found. After recording all the defects found, the roads will be measured using the PCI method, which is Pavement Condition Index of Calculation, using ASTM as a guide. PCI value is categorized based on the value obtained. The road condition is based on the PCI rating as shown in the picture above. This research has also interviewed the professionals who is an expert in road condition and familiar with the Mersing District Road. The secondary data found in this study is journals, articles, books, dissertation, and many more. Research analysis and findings. These are the findings of the observation. Alligator cracking, polish aggregate, and patching are the most common defects occurred on all the five roads. Some defects like longitudinal cracking, depression, raveling, and pothole rarely occurs. PCI results of each five roads in Mersing District are shown in the table. Based on the five roads, the overall result was that the roads were good and adequate in the Mersing District. Two roads were, by comparison, very poor and severe. The interview also collected data on the poor state of two roads in the study. The interviewees commented that vehicle overload, high traffic volume, and the age of the roads are older and not maintained correctly were the causes of the faults on this route. Conclusion From this study, the greatest number of road defects on the five roadways are polished aggregate, patching, and cracking. The road condition immersing was one with excellent road condition, two satisfactory roads, a very poor, and severe road conditions. Malaysia's present level of maintenance and repair technology is adequate, although improvement is still possible. Hence, to ensure correct financing for road maintenance, the road maintenance firm should always examine and be aware of the road conditions. The results show that the lowest priority roads require better maintenance planning and consistent implementation. There is insufficient data from the road samples to draw a finding on a district's road deterioration rate. Future research could investigate these problems successfully by expanding their data into more districts and number of roads. Here are my reference. Thank you for listening. Assalamualaikum, I'm Amirah Alfa Muhammad Noor from Faculty of Architecture, Planning and Surveying UITM Campus Sri Iskandar. So today, I will present to you about my research paper entitled, Adoption of Culasic in Industrialized Building System Projects. I'll start off by talking about the background of the study. Nation construction sector is transforming from conventional method into mechanized system known as Industrialized Building System, IBS. This system is supported up by a large demand for affordable low cost into middle cost housing. However, many issues have been debated by practitioners towards the efficiency of the system. One of the main issues was related to difficulty in controlling quality standard of the IBS components. CIDB implemented quality assessment system in construction QLASIC as an independent tool for measuring and evaluating the quality of workmanship of construction works based on CIS 7 2006 to resolve the problems in Malaysian construction quality. According to Chi Ali 2014, it is therefore expected that the introduction of QLASIC would resolve some of the prevailing quality concerns in the construction sector. Next, I'll move on to the problem statement. But 2016 stated that defect issues can cause an increasing in the construction costs in terms of life cycle costs. 6 to 15% construction costs wasted due to rework found it during construction, and 5% construction costs wasted due to rework detected during maintenance. According to Muhammad Iti Alia 2016, several past projects built with IBS concept resulted in poor quality and high construction costs. IBS has been widely adopted in nation construction projects nowadays, but it still has issues regarding quality of the buildings. Regarding these issues, 
Curacid can be implemented as the quality assessment tools to evaluate the performance workmanship quality in IBS project. Therefore, this paper aims to analyze the impacts of adoption of Curacid assessment in the industrialized building system project. And the research objective is to determine the impacts of QLAC assessment for IBS project. As for the literature review on the impacts of QLAC assessment, Manap Goh and Shahrum 2018 stated that QLAC can assist the contractor to prioritize the areas that need to be improved. Meanwhile, according to Ahmad Sabri and Osman 2014, the construction cost of any project undergoing the quality assessment system will be slightly higher due to there are additional costs of 10 to 15% in total in terms of materials, plan, and labor. However, but 2016 argued that QLAC actually can save costs in the long term as contractors will be free from rectification works, which can cost a lot of money. As for the methodology, quantitative method by means of questionnaire survey is implementing as an instrument in the data collection. The population of the study is all IBS contractors from G1 to G7 who had registered with CIDB. Therefore, based on the formula by Craig and Morgan, the total sample is 335. The area of the research is in Central Zone because Selangor and Kuala Lumpur has recorded the highest number of IBS contractors that had been registered with CIDB. A self-administered questionnaire was distributed to the targeted respondents via email and collected data were analyzed in descriptive analysis including frequency, percentage, and mean by using SPSS software and presented in tabulated form for ease of understanding. This is the analysis on impacts of QLAC assessment for IBS project. The results obtained from the analysis revealed that QLAC assessment helps to raise the credibility of construction projects among clients, took the first rank among others. This indicates that QLAC assessment enables the construction stakeholders, such as contractor and developer, to earn the public's trust as a credible and trusted company. The quality of workmanship of IBS project increases, and long-term quality can be achieved rank second which both share the same mean score. Enhances the quality of IBS projects in Malaysia has a mean distribution of 3.48 and is the lowest part for the impact of QLAC assessment for IBS projects. To sum up, the respondents are on agreeable for all elements listed in the table. As a conclusion, this research highlighted on the impacts of adoption of QLAC assessment in IBS project. It can be summarized that most of the IBS contractors acknowledge the good impacts when adopting QLAC assessment in their project as all the elements were on agreeable for the perception level. Thus, the study is significant to the IBS contractors as it can assist the IBS contractors to understand the impacts and the importance of using QLASIC in their projects. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. Reaching out to rescue one another is an eternal love. Therefore, rescue is not just a verb, it is a promise. But before that, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good day, a bit to respective panels and fellow viewers. I am Kamara Ashraf, a construction technology undergraduate, I'd like to present my innovation project, namely Advanced Fire Evacuation Model, or Astute 23. The advanced fire evacuation model, namely ASHUT 23, is designed to evacuate and elevate high risk group consists of pregnant women, disabled individuals, senior citizens, and trapped occupants that may not be able to use staircases during fire outbreaks. This product is applicable in many types of buildings, including condominiums, apartments, flats, hotel, and many more. It provides optimum protection against direct flame and radiator heat during escaping. It consists of inflatable vertical tube to be utilized in case of maximum occupancy load reached. When a unit of house in the residential buildings caught fire, disabled individual, pregnant woman, or any trapped occupants that are unable to escape through emergency staircase due to obstruction and hindrance, they may push the emergency button located in the house to notify the system. By pressing the button, 
a signal will be delivered to the nearest fire station in the same time notify the SQ23. The automated generator will activate the system and retracted cabin will slide vertically on steel railing to the affected floor. It will continue by sliding horizontally to reach occupants in the affected unit. Once it is ready, retractable cabin will expand to its maximum size before ready to accommodate occupants. Without any existence, occupants that were trained may use the model. When fire spreads rapidly, they can shut the accordion fire rated door to give a temporary protection against direct flame and radiated heat. Occupants may elevate the cabin down to the safer location. If there are more than 15 people need rapid evacuation, the cabin will act as platform for the vertical escape chute. Occupants have to open the hinge lid covers and turn the knob to release the inflatable chute. This method can evacuate approximately 20 persons in a minute. The elasticized strand and woven materials will make sure the occupant does not slide hazardously. The following explanation is on the product strength and performance analysis. Basically, there are six elements can be tackled orderly. They are the evacuation time, occupancy load, energy efficiency, moving mechanism, flexibility and cost estimation. The combination of these elements is a key solution for the issue arise in the existing evacuation plan. Alright, in comparison, SU23 has total evacuation time of 3 minutes per cycle. It is slightly faster compared to the existing escape rescue system. The capacity of the cabin accommodates 10 to 15% per time, which is higher than ERS. The occupancy load is similar to ERS with a total of 250 kg or 551 pounds. The maximum weight capacity is designed in consideration of average household size in Malaysia without overlooking cost factor with an average of 3 to 7% in a house. The design cutting edge is where S223 is capable to travel vertically and horizontally unlike ERS and vertical escape chute. Therefore, it covers a more area to rescue and elevate people down to safer location with 10 meter per minute high velocity. The accomplishment of this study will bring significance to many parties. It provides key solutions for reachability, availability and reliability issues in the current evacuation plan. To provide means of escape for high-risk occupants can reduce the local fatal accident rate FAR upon residents comprehensively. This innovation also achieved the third sustainable development goal, which is to reduce the number of deaths and injuries. It fostered innovation in construction industry and reduced the impacts to a society and environment at large. Last but not least, should you have further queries, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you for your time. Stay safe and get vaccinated. The overall process of this is input is a linear switch as a device. Process will be used as the low below R3 as a device, and then the output devices will be larger I2C LCD and siren. So this is the assembled process of the automatic reservoir. So imagine this plywood is a wall on a building, and then this other board will be connected by a wiring circuit to the control panel, buzzer and siren. Uh, this control panel, buzzer and siren will be located in, in the guard house, which is guard house is, all, is the only place that uh, always have people standing by on their duty. So that is why I have choose uh, the location of the control panel is at the guard house. And then in this model box, I have implemented this limit switches, limit switch, uh, which is it can detect the motion of the access door of this model box. 
and then uh, this is what it looks like in uh, control panel which is Arduino, breadboard, two batteries, switches, uh, relay timer and LCD. Uh, the function of this relay timer is I want to create a time gap for this siren to work in. I will show you the video of the simulation of how it works. So this is the assemble process. And then this is the simulation of how the unit switch is work. You can see here the edges of the limit switch. And then let's, let's take a look at the demonstration. When the nozzle box is open, the LCD and buzzer will turn on. And then this real timer, I have set for the time which is for 10 seconds and then after 10 seconds this siren will turn on so uh, in conclusion uh, all of the all of these three output devices will be turned on and the function of this LCD is to indicate the location of the nozzle box, which in which is it is being opened. So, in order to test the effectiveness, I have performed four analysis to study its strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and traits of the automatic nozzle box. And then, for the strength of the automatic nozzle box. Uh, I can see that it is effective monitoring features because it is using limit switches which is limit switch is very sensitive to any movement that has been made and then the next one is adjustable time gap for the siren uh, which is I have used the relay timer and then LCD can be customized and then the weaknesses is inspection and maintenance for the batteries need to do regularly and siren, buzzer and LCD will be turned off the limit switch when the limit switch is being pulled and for the opportunities uh, it can be installed also at the premises windows door and gate and it can be applied into the unlimited number of the nozzle board as long as we know how to make its coding and then the trait is only one which is vulnerable to the person who knows about the function of the limit switches that's all for me Assalamualaikum and greetings to everyone. I'm Farah Ashikin from International Islamic University, Malaysia, and I'm going to present about an investigation on cost-effective approaches for the Pusu River rehabilitation. The study was based on the rivers in AUM Gombak Campus area, which is Pusu River. Generally, Pusu River has two tributaries, namely Anak Sungai Pusu and Batang Sungai Pusu. The total catchment area of Pusu River that flows through the IUM Guamba campus area is estimated to be 12 square kilometer. Furthermore, the Pusu River is said to be contributed to the Guamba River and then it will be joined with other rivers to form the main Kelang River. For years, Pusu River and its tributaries that flow through the IUM Guamba campus have been suffering from river pollution. It has been noted that the pollution is the result of land exploitation near the rivers. This simultaneously caused in high turbidity and sediment content of the river which also has changed the physical character of the river. Even though the rivers in IUM today are not being used for consumption or water-based activities, but there is some interdependence between the university community and the rivers. There are riverside sitting areas, crossing bridges and also IUM's international status. Due to this reason, it is believed that these rivers have the potential to be graded up and rehabilitated. 
Consequently, the study to identify and propose cost-effective approaches to rehabilitate the Pusu River was carried out. And the objective of the study are, first, to study the river rehabilitation methods, and secondly, to propose the cost-effective approaches to rehabilitate the Pusu River. According to the authors, rehabilitation implies the same uh, cost as restoration, which is an act of restoring the ecosystem to its predisturbed uh, natural condition. However, because the ecosystem can be restored completely, these actions are more accurately to be conveyed as rehabilitation. Based on the literature, there are various methods to rehabilitate the river. The methods are sediment dredging, aquatic plants, a hard approach of riverbank protection, a softer approach of riverbank protection, and also effective microorganisms. The study employed Delphi approach as the method to gather the primary data, while the descriptive group statistical analysis was used for the data analysis. According to the Delphi study, all of the river rehabilitation approaches that were obtained from the uh, literature review were considered to be appropriate for the rehabilitation of Pusu River. It can be said that uh, using the aquatic plants is considered as the most cost-effective approach, while the hard approach of riverbank protection is perceived as the least cost-effective approach. From the result, it also can be noted that approaches that involve landscaping and soft engineering elements were voted to be most cost-effective approaches. Thus, the top three cost-effective approaches are uh, the usage of aquatic plants, the softer approach of uh, riverbank protection, and also the sediment dredging. And these three approaches would be regarded as the top priority approaches to be proposed for the rehabilitation of Pusu River. Another important point that raised by the panelists is that these approaches should be integrated because one approach will not be able to solve the problem completely. To conclude, the river rehabilitation is regarded as one of the primary efforts to address the pollution of Pusu River and this paper has presented the findings on the cost-effective approaches for the rehabilitation of Pusu River based on the results from the Delphi study and literature review. And that's all. Thank you. Five, ten, twenty years ago, I could have never imagined that this helicopter could be an important start of today's technology. But how does the construction progress monitoring start? Construction progress monitoring. Traditionally, it lays on the dependencies of human supervision. But as much as human intervention is needed, it is costly for a large-scale project. However, I was broke up to believe that this required effort for conventional monitoring can significantly reduce by digitalized system. What kind of digitalized system? This one, drone. The evolution of technology from a toy copter has contributed to the emergence of drone. As you can see, drone is an efficient monitoring tool due to its ability to fly over from monitoring the construction progress and at the same time it produces pictures and video. Excellent, right? Because of that, most of the previous researcher mentioning Cron as a cost-effective monitoring method. However, did you know that aside from the purchasing cost of the Cron, Cron is also associated to the other external cost factors. For example, maintenance costs, operational costs, training costs, and insurance costs. Therefore, my research aims to identify the overall cost of using drone for monitoring the construction progress, whether it provides the cost advantages or otherwise. In order to achieve my research aim, I conducted the interview with the construction industry player who used drone to monitor the construction progress of a building project. I started by selecting the most suitable sampling method, then I distributed the questionnaire to the selected population. The respondent fulfilled the set of criteria? Yes, I invite the respondent for interview. No? And As a result from the interview, what I found is that only hardware and maintenance costs are the cost element experienced by all the respondents. And it is not even reached the half number of respondents who's taking insurance and permit costs to operate the drone. 
And something you never guess is that bad weather and drone damages are also regarded as an additional cost element experienced by all the respondents. For the overall cost experienced by all the respondents, it could be above 1,000 ringgit and up to the nearest 12,000 ringgit. This cost implication faced by the construction industry player are varied due to the cost element experienced by them are different. If you can see the zero number in the table, it indicates that there is a respondent who doesn't experience those cost elements at all. Moreover, there are respondents who are unable to acknowledge the exact value of the cost they encounter. It shows that there is a lack of proper documentation kept by the interviewees on the money spent for the drone. Regardless how much is the cost experienced by the interviewee, almost 75% of them still regarded drone as a cost-effective monitoring method. In conclusion, both drone and conventional monitoring has its own cost implication. Therefore, before you start to invest your money in anything, start it by investing your time to learn about the thing. Thank you. Thank you.